Hello everybody and welcome to the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez and the Team Principals Press Conference. And I'm delighted to say we're joined by Christian Horner, Mike Crack and Ayo Komatsu. Now, Mike, can we start uh, with you, uh, first of all? Uh, except there's one of your drivers is celebrating um, a landmark occasion this weekend, 400 races. Can we just start by discussing what makes Fernando Alonso so special? Yeah, I think that is a question that we could ask many, many people in the F1 paddock. He has worked with, uh, with a lot of teams already. Um, I think we are privileged to, to be able to organize the, the celebration now or the party, but I think uh, it's tribute to to everybody that has worked with him for all these years in the first place. But then, uh, obviously, the individual um, you know, incredible career um, over the last 20 plus years, 400 race start. I wish I could give him a winning car on Sunday. Um, it will be difficult, but um, I think all in all, if you, if you look back uh, or if you look at how uh, at an advanced stage of the career he's still performing, it's incredible. So if you ask about, about yeah, characters or, or adjectives, uh, there are many, but I think what you need to really point out is the talent, obviously, as many people are having, but then the discipline and foremost, I think, the, 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 the desire the desire to compete, super competitive. So super competitive, super disciplined, and super talented. Can I bring in the other two on this particular topic? Ayo, you worked with Fernando when you were at Renault. What is your overriding memory of that time? Yeah, so I was a tire engineer back then, so I was doing uh, lots of tire testing with uh, Fernando. And what struck me was just unbelievable ability to understand. You know, if you give him, okay, this is, uh, I want you to do 20 lap stint, on these tires, I, I want you to do these lap times for the final five laps of the stint and then completely use up the tire on the end up. He can just do that, bang on, know exactly what it's gonna be like by like lap two, lap three, how he drives, he knows what tire is gonna be like in lap 20 and he never underused or overused the tires. He can really hit that, bang on, then I was really amazed at that ability. And also like Mike said, just the desire, he loves the sport, doesn't he? And then just a desire, but um, yeah, that was a really uh, eye-opener for me. Thanks, Ayo. And, and Christian, I believe you nearly signed Fernando on a couple of occasions. What was it like to negotiate with him? Well, look, I mean, he's a, a, a formidable, formidable competitor. And uh, at the end of his McLaren stint, the first one in 08, I remember going to Madrid and, and pushing to get him in the car. And we wanted to do a two-year deal. And he was only prepared to sign for one year. Um, and we were convinced he had a Ferrari contract in his back pocket at that point. So, so we, didn't, we didn't get to a deal. And, uh, you know, had he come to us in 2009, um, you know, maybe things could have looked, you know, slightly, slightly differently. And even halfway through the 2009 season, he was convinced if he got in our car, he could still win the championship that year. So that was, that was at that point we then had a conversation. I remember meeting with him, with, with Adrian, in the back of a... Uh, in the back of a hire car at Spa Airport. Uh, I think that was around 2011, um, 11 or 12, about again coming, coming across from Ferrari, and then even as early as the beginning of this year. You know, um, So it's incredible the longevity that he's had, the competitiveness that he has, and, and, and the statistics uh, you know, he, for the talent that he has and the ability he has you know, two, two world championships don't do him justice. He's, you know, he, he should have won more than that. All right, thanks. So, Mike, let's come back to you. Now, how is Fernando, first of all? He um, wasn't at the track yesterday because he was feeling poorly. Is he okay today? Yeah, he came uh, this morning all normal. Uh, we were in touch, obviously, all the time. Uh, so he's, he's fine and he will drive uh, now the second session. All right, let's talk car performance now with regards to Aston. You had the upgrade. Uh, in Austin last weekend, did it perform as expected, and will that translate here in Mexico? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, if you look at it, uh, it was a sprint weekend. Uh, we decided to, to, to start with both cars identical, uh, basically throw, throwing everything at it. Um, and uh, it was not easy the whole weekend. Uh, we, we turned the car uh, up, we turned it down, we went stiff, we went soft. Um, but we couldn't really extract the performance that we wanted to, to extract from it. We were, we were, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, it was, it was, it was tough. Um, and uh, from this, we said, okay, we come to Mexico and then we have to, 
do a little bit more homework, we will have a bit more time. Uh, you have seen probably both cars had uh, big rakes uh, on today. Um, they ran with different specification and they will run also different specification this afternoon. So it's about understanding uh, what we have not understood yet uh, and do better going forward. Just, it seems you're experimenting a lot at the moment. How, how are you viewing these last five races of the season? Is it all about 2025 and preparing yourself as best as possible for that? Yeah, I think that is, that is the case for, for most of the teams. Uh, everybody has his eyes on, on 25, except if you have like uh, uh, big ambitions for the championship or different uh, championship positions. So uh, it's about learning the, the maximum, but then we also, uh, this is not only a learning exercise, uh, we're not here for learning only. Um, I think uh, when, 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 when Saturday and Sunday starts, you have, to, you have to go racing and you have to go with the best car you have. So uh, I think the Friday is good to, to, to experiment and to, to try and learn for the future, uh, prepare as much as you can, but then uh, come Saturday, Sunday, you, I think you have to run what, what you think is the fastest you have. Thank you. Uh, look, final one from me, Mike. Um, Andy Cow, Group CEO, was at Austin. It was his first race with the team. Um, how was the debrief? after the race weekend, what comments did he have about the team? Well, it was very good to have Andy around in, uh, in, uh, in Austin um, so that he gets an overview of how, how we operate at the track. He, he was at, at factory already for, for a couple of weeks. Um, it's obviously a lot about getting to know the people, getting to know uh, how we do things. And uh, um, I have to say I was, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very positive about how it went so far. Uh, it very calm, very structured approach, uh, very factual, um, which, uh, which is very promising. And uh, from, from, the, yeah, from, the, from the early talks, early beginnings or early conversations, uh, I think I get an understanding why he was so successful in, in the places where he was before. All right. Mike, thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be more questions for you in a minute. Ayo, can we come to you now? So five consecutive points finishes for the team. Just tell us, first of all, what is the atmosphere like inside Haas at the moment? Yeah, atmosphere is uh, really good. So obviously, uh, uh, you know, scoring point is difficult, but uh, we have to put everything together. So to do that in uh, five consecutive e events is uh, great. So uh, yeah, atmosphere is really positive. Now, let's talk upgrades. Obviously, it was a big upgrade in Austin. It worked, but it appears that all of the upgrades you're introducing this year are working when you put them on the car. That hasn't always been the case for the team. Um, what's changed? Yeah, so this year, you know, all the upgrades, it's not like everything worked completely perfectly, you know, but uh, none of the upgrade made the car slower. So every time we put the upgrades on the car, we actually made the car faster. Uh, what's changed, it's really, uh, we still got the similar people, you know, same people, really. So details, you know, about communication, trying to work together as a team, listen to each other, give people freedom. So really those are, let's say, simple, fundamental things that we really focused on. And I'm really pleased that they're now, uh, you know, seeing the result of it. And you're in a, an intense battle uh, in the Constructors' Championship with VCarb, just two points the difference at the moment. You're ahead. Who do you feel has the faster car at the moment? Um, I think it really depends on the event. You know, they've got upgrades here as well. And then, uh, so like FP1, they looked quick. We're not very happy with the car. So I, I think it really depends every event. And also, like, even like track temperature, that can swing uh, things as well. So it's very difficult to say who's got upper hand for remaining five races. I think we got to maximize everything you got every day, every race. OK, look, final one from me, the technical partnership with Toyota. Uh, you announced that before the Austin weekend. You went uh, to Japan for the announcement. Um, it's working in addition to your existing relationships with Dallara and Ferrari. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how you're weaving it all together to work in harmony? Yeah, obviously, uh, Ferrari and Dallara has been an uh, amazing partner since day one. And then, as you can see, you know, Ferrari, obviously, the PU partner, gearbox, suspension, hydraulics, etc. Those areas, obviously, Toyota is not touching. You know, the area that Toyota is touching is the area that we don't get support from Ferrari, and they've been doing it on our own. So, um, yeah, that really just adds to our capability and then a chance to understand the car better so that we can uh, make our team more competitive. And Ayo, how long term is this deal with Toyota? I mean, hypothetically, if Gene Haas were to say one day that he wanted to sell his team, do, do Toyota have first refusal on buying it? 
to start with, Gene's not setting the team. You know, every single time, you know, he's asking me, how can we go better? You know, what, what can we do to make the car go faster? He's not interested in setting. I think, I believe he had uh, so many offers actually, but he refused every single one of them. So team's not up for sale. And then, um, yeah, so we haven't even spoken about a uh, fast refusal or anything like that. That's not being on the topic. Um, it is a long term, very long term. All right. Ayo, thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be more questions for you in a minute. Christian, coming to you now. Um, Max was saying last weekend in Austin that the, the RB20 has taken a step forward. Just how big a step? I think it was a, a, a positive step. I mean, to, to get the pole for the sprint, to win the sprint race. Arguably, uh, we, we, you know, we were certainly in contention for the pole uh, for the Grand Prix. Um, qualified ultimately on the, you know, on the front row. The, the bit that we under-delivered on, I think, with the setup changes perhaps after the sprint race that we that we perhaps um, you know, overcompensated was, uh, was the Grand Prix itself, where we just had too much understeer in the car. So, um, so a sprint race win, a, a, a fighting third, uh, you know, was, uh, was, was a very positive you know, weekend. And I think that you know, the engineers and design team and manufacturing supply chain, they've been all working tremendously hard back in the UK. And uh, it's good to see performance getting uh, you know, through to the car. Okay, there was a slight engine problem on Max's car this morning, but have you seen enough already in FP1 to believe that the performance will translate here in Mexico? It's a different circuit, it's a different challenge. Uh, obviously the altitude here, things work a bit differently. Um, you know, the, we hit a piece of signage um, that fell off the bridge in the first session, which did a little bit of damage to the floor, but that's been repaired, the engine issue thankfully was, uh, was a, 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 a menial uh, issue and, and has been rectified hopefully for the next session. Okay, so Checo's, let's talk about Checo, home race uh, this weekend. Now in the press conference yesterday, he described 2024, and I'm quoting him now, as a terrible season. How would you describe it? I think he's summed it up perfectly. Um, it's been a, been a, uh, a, a bad year. Um, you know, for Checo, he started strongly, and and obviously he's he struggled for form since you know pretty much Imola onwards, and it's been sporadic. We saw um, you know flashes of performance. Azerbaijan, uh, arguably, he could have won that race, uh, you know, almost a month ago. So we know what he's capable of, and I, and we're hoping that we can give him uh, you know a setup and a, and the confidence in the car to to extract the kind of performances that we know he's. You know he's he's very capable of. What does the future hold for Checo? Um, look, Checo's our driver. He's he's contracted for 2025. Um, you know he's he's competitive. He's he's hungry. He's not happy with where he he currently is. So uh, as a team, we're doing our very best to you know to support him. And uh, uh, you know obviously the big weekend for him here. Huge support. Um, I think he's endorsing every product from Uber Eats to um, toilet roll, um, you know, this weekend. So it's impressive, uh, you know, how many endorsements he's managed to, to line up for himself. Christian, this is probably a nice segue to talk about Liam Lawson. How impressed were you by his comeback race in Austin? I was very impressed. I mean, to jump in a car, a circuit that he'd not been to before, um, you know, the pressure of just having to get in and get on with it over a sprint weekend, I thought he acquitted himself very well, and I think that uh, you know to go from the back to, to ninth and score points on his uh, seasonal debut. I thought I thought he did a did a super job. What do you think he'd do in a Red Bull? I mean, that's that's difficult to hypothesise. I mean, he's he's obviously a talented you know guy. We know a bit about him from the work he's been doing in tire testing and and so on. And he's a talent that's continuing to nurture and continuing. To grow, so it's it's uh, interesting to see how um, you know he performs over these remaining five races. All right, Christian, thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be more for you in a second. Let's now open this to the floor. As ever, name and publication. Who's first, please? Yep, Luke. Uh, Luke Smith from the Athletic. Um, Christian, on the driver front, uh, Helmut has suggested it might be at the end of the season that you guys make a decision on where drivers are placed next year between Liam and Checo. Is that the plan? Are you going to get to the end of the year to give the fullness of time to assess everything? And what can Checo do in these final five races to ensure he's definitely in that seat next year? Well, as I uh, mentioned earlier, Checo has a contract for next year, so he's 
Uh, he's currently our driver for, for, for 2025. Um, obviously, there is a, a seat available in, uh, in, in VCAR, but, uh, and they're all Red Bull Racing drivers that are on, that are on loan. So, um, you know, we have the, 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 the benefit of, of time to sit down with uh, Laurent and Peter and, and look at all the options. Thanks, Christian. All right, another one. Yep. Okay. Niharika from Sportskater. A question for Christian. Uh, Christian, um, there has been a war of words between you and McLaren, and Andrea Stella, after the race, had clearly uh, denied um, appealing against the decision by the stewards in the race against Norris, and they have applied for appeal against it today, and there's a summoning for Red Bull. So is this, does, does there seem to be some kind of a vendetta that McLaren have towards Red Bull, or is it just speculation that such a narrative has been doing the rounds? I didn't catch all of that. I think it was mainly about McLaren and um, accusations that are being made. Um, well, first of all, in terms of war, war of words, um, I, I'm always intrigued to read that because I don't think we've been making too many comments about, um, about McLaren. Um, obviously, they've um, uh, raised their, their right of uh, review um, over, over last weekend, which is their right. And, um, uh, you know the FIA um, will 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 hear that uh, you know through their through their their process now um, you know inevitably when you're running at the sharp end then everything comes under more scrutiny and um, you can feel that uh, you know certainly certainly McLaren are being quite vocal in in certain aspects um, you know about many many parts of uh, you know. Our team, our car, um, uh, stewards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, thanks, Christian. Another one. Yep. Uh, Dan Lawrence, Motorsport Monday, MotorsportWeek.com. Question for Christian: uh, I've noticed throughout the year you've singing the praises of your junior driver Arvid Lindblad. So I was just wondering if you could go into more detail about what impresses you so much about him. And secondly, with him progressing to F2 next year, Isaac in an F2 title fight this year. Does that sort of have an implication on how you structure the, the 2025 F1 driver lineup across the two teams? Thank you. Well, firstly, both the juniors are uh, very impressive, Isaac Hajar and uh, Arvid Limblad. Um, you know, Isaac competing, as you say, for that Formula 2 championship and, and showing great promise this year. And when you see the quality of the F2 guys jumping in and, and delivering the way they are, I think it uh, uh, you know, shows the, the, the level and the standard that's currently in you know, in the junior category. You know, Arvid um, is definitely a talent for the future. Um, I think that he's got the right attitude, he's got the right approach um, and determination, and certainly what we've seen in some of his racing, Silverstone in particular this year, um, you know, he's, he's a very talented driver, so only time will tell how good he is and how far he can go, but uh, certainly he and Isaac are both talents that we're, um, you know, we're quite excited about. Yep, Alex. Alex, Alex Karamokos, Autosport. Another question to Christian on a very similar topic, actually. I wondered if you could give us your overall assessment of the health of the Red Bull Young Driver program. I mean, in the past, you've brought a significant number of drivers into Formula One, some of whom wouldn't have made it without your backing. But of late, seems to be a little bit more of a struggle to get young drivers through and, and certainly to get them successful. So what's going on there and what do you think about it? Thanks. I think the junior program has been tremendously successful over the years. We're giving many, many drivers the opportunity of, of getting to Formula One, and even if that's not with Red Bull Racing, that they've gone on to have careers in, you know, in, in other teams. And, and the program has, has changed a little. It, it was, in previous years, quite top-heavy uh, in, in talent in Formula Two, Formula Three. That's been inverted now, so um, we're going further down the chain. And, I think Helmut has just signed his first nine-year-old. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we've got you know, youngsters in karting, we've got youngsters in, in, in the junior formerly, and it's, uh, it's always been a philosophy of Red Bull to, to invest in, in young talent, and, um, you know, that continues, continues to very much be the case. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, Christian. Motorsport Magazine.com, another question for you, Christian. Um, you talked earlier about Fernando and the three times uh, you were talking to him about a potential contract with Red Bull Racing. The first two, I think, are more or less well documented so far. The third one you mentioned was at the beginning of the year. Given the fact that you have two drivers on the contract, uh, what was the scenario you discussed with Fernando at the beginning of the year? 
Uh, well, at, at that time, uh, Sergio's contract hadn't been extended. So as Fernando is a seasoned operator, um, you know, he, he always wants to know all of his, all of his options. And uh, between him and, and his manager uh, or advisor of many years, Flavio, they're, they're always, um, you know, testing the market. And um, it just shows how, how hungry and competitive you know he is, um, and you know he's still he's still delivering at 42 years of age. Um, is he 42? 43. Um, you know he's uh, he's still in great shape, and and it just shows that age is just a number. Um, so, uh, so so yeah, you know he's uh, he's he, he's still a very very capable you know Grand Prix driver. Given the tools, I'm sure he'd be at the front. Thank you. Another one. Erwin Jechi, Motorsport.com. Question for Christian. Um, Honda has been pushing for a Red Bull F1 test for Yuki. Yuki has been asking for it. Uh, where are you currently with this? And do you think Yuki is deserving for a Red Bull F1 test chance, given his current performance? Well, Yuki, obviously, again, is a member of the, of the junior team. It's something that we have discussed with Honda. Um, we gave Yuki a run up the hill at Goodwood um, earlier in the year um, that was unexpected and he was the first driver to drive a current Formula One car in an open face helmet and goggles. Um, so he will test the car again at the tar test following um, the conclusion of the season. It's something that's been agreed for quite some time and uh, it will again be good to give him a run um, and get the opportunity to work with rebel racing engineers um, and, and see how he performs in a Red Bull racing car. Thank you. Yep, another one. Uh, Tim Harini, TSN. Question for all three of you. Uh, following on from the battle between Max and Lando at the Circuit of the Americas, the uh, conversation of track deterrence have, has come up. I just uh, wanted to get your guys' opinions on track deterrence because all three of you have been in motorsports for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Let's stop with you. Yeah, I think sometimes we have a rules that is not really solving the fundamental issues. I think for me, like a qualifying maximum safety guideline times the same thing. Then uh, these driving guidelines, it creates another problems, right? So for me, I'd like to see much simpler solution where drivers can race more freely. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, there has been a lot of discussions around it over the last weeks. Uh, I think mainly because it was the two championship contenders, but uh, there has been other other overtakes uh, with uh, letting each other room or not room or trying to pass on the outside. To be honest, I think uh, uh, the majority of incidents have been uh, judged correctly. Um, if you take the, the guidelines as they are, um, now you can discuss are the guidelines the right way to go racing or not, but I think that is something that... FIA and the drivers uh, have agreed at the, end, at the start of the year, and uh, that is what is being applied. So, um, to be honest, I do not really get why there is such a such an uphaul at the moment about it. Uh, we had a circuit where, obviously, you can run on the outside, and then uh, you, you also try to use it to your advantage. So, all in all, I think uh, you know, uh, early on the year uh, we were among the concerns at the time. Uh, we had a good look at it, and. Uh, we think that uh, in the majority, as I said, it has been dealt with uh, in the correct way. Yeah, I think, look, I mean, these things are discussed at length with the team managers and, and drivers, and I think we've got a set of guidelines that are pretty clear. In some cases, they make um, cricket look simple. Um, but I, I think the fundamental thing uh, about last weekend uh, is, you know, it's natural that two drivers are going to push each other hard, and, and you can't overtake off the circuit. now. For me, there would be a much simpler solution that we saw it in Austria. You put gravel on the exit of a corner, drivers won't go there. Um, and I know that cost and, and, and restrictions come in from, from that perspective, but I think have a deterrent on the exit of a corner like Turn 12, for example, in, in Austin, and, and you wouldn't find a driver running wide because he's, he's going to go significantly slower, maybe damage his car. and. Uh, uh, cost him significant time. So for me, that keep it simple. Um, try and go back to basics. Okay, thanks. All oh, more questions? Yeah, Luke. Uh, Luke Smith from the Athletic. For all three of you, Ollie Oaks has joined your gang this year as the newest F1 team principal. I just want to get your thoughts on how have you found working with Ollie so far, and Christian, your experience as being a very young team principal. He's 36, not too far off your age when you started. 
Oli. Uh, well, it's great to see um, you know a, a, a bunch of new guys coming in, whether it's Io or um, you know Oli. And um, uh, you know it was interesting. I, I remember my first Formula One commission meeting that I attended at uh, Heathrow back in 2005, and you know Ron Dennis was there, and uh, Flavio was there, and Jean Todd was there for Ferrari, and Bernie was running it with Max Mosley and so on, and and. I remember sitting through the meeting and loads of things were discussed but absolutely was nothing was agreed and coming out of the meeting quite confused as to other than the day of the week it was and when the next meeting was going to be nothing had been concluded and I was glad to see that progress in the last 20 years has been significant because I got the impression from Ollie following the meeting that he had no idea what had been agreed or um, that there was any conclusions to anything so but it's great to see you know, uh, new blood coming into uh, into Formula One. Yeah, there's some similarities. Huh? When I joined, I thought about this. It's very similar to you, Christian. And I think uh, Oli thought the same. But I think uh, Oli is not a beginner. You know, he was uh, uh, very successful in junior categories with uh, high tech. I think he has been a great driver. Uh, so I think he knows or understands racing inside out. And uh, you know, he, you, you have to be careful. He comes across as, as very young and junior, but he, he knows he, he knows everything about racing and how, how teams are run and operated. Um, he has been a nice addition. Uh, he's a great guy, nice guy. Uh, I met him in Austin, actually, on, on Wednesday by coincidence, and we had a small chat. So, yeah, he's a good guy and uh, a great addition to the club. Uh, and let's see, uh, maybe you ask him next time when he's sitting here to see what he thinks about it. Yeah, I've only started in January, right? So I'm on the same boat, you know. But um, no, it's a exciting opportunity, interesting opportunity. I'm sure he's uh, highly capable and he's really enjoying that. So yeah, good to have him. All right. Okay, thanks. So another question, please. Yep. Louis Decker, NOS for Christian. You already, I had an answer uh, for you prepared about gravel, but you already already did. So I've got another question about engines, gearboxes, etc. Do you think Max will need to take more grid penalties in the remaining races, or are you safe? I don't think you're ever safe, um, as we've just seen in the last session, but hopefully that's just a, 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 a small issue. I think it's something probably more of a question for, for our engine partner as to how comfortable they feel getting to the end of the year. But um, you know, you're always, always on the limit. Thank you. Another one, Adam. Um, Adam Cooper, Adam Cooper, for another question for Christian. Um, can I ask you about the, the right of review from McLaren? I know it's ongoing. Um, were you surprised that that suddenly popped up, considering how rarely they ever succeed? Um, do you know what their new evidence is? Does it have any, any merit at all? Well, obviously, there's a criteria that it has to fill. Whether, um, whether it fills that, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't think there is any new evidence. Um, so, look, I mean, you have to trust in the, in, in the process. I think that the stewards are in difficult positions. I felt that the calls they made were, were absolutely fair and, 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 and right at the weekend. You can't overtake a car off the circuit. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where we are. It's McLaren's right to invoke that. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it would have been probably they're probably ruining the fact that they didn't let Max back pass because they had such a pace advantage at that part of the race with the overlap of the fresher tire that they would have probably quite easily passed Max in those last, last four laps anyway. Thanks, Christian. Time for one more. Yep. Uh, Christian, uh, Sebastian Aces from ESPN Mexico. I would like to ask you about that race engineer Beard. Uh, in Mexico, he has been criticized alongside Checo Perez's performance. What do you think about that? Look, I mean, uh, you know, when you put yourself out there uh, as, a, as a race engineer and you're the, the, the voice speaking to the driver, uh, in today's world of digital media, um, everybody has an opinion, everybody has a, um, uh, you know, their own, their own view on things. Now, I think Hugh does a super job. He's a really bright guy. He's grown up in the team. Um, he's out there giving his best for his driver, for his team. And I think it's very harsh for people to, to judge and criticize from the outside when they have about 1% of the facts of what he's actually dealing with. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about opening up everything in Formula One is 
the access that we now give. The downside is the amount of armchair specialists and experts that we get that it opens up to. Uh, Hugh Bird's a very talented engineer and an important part of our team, and uh, um, I think any criticism of him is is unfair. Thank you, Christine. Thank you to all three of you. We will.